Hi, I'm Michael Weiss, uh, Director of Special Investigations at the Free Russia Foundation. Uh, today, I am very happy to be moderating a discussion on the Kremlin's Influence Quarterly, which is an online publication put out by the Free Russia Foundation, analyzing the Kremlin's malign activities in Europe aimed at undermining European values and democratic institutions. Uh, the quarterly will feature case studies collected by the foundation team and theoretical methodologies developed by its scholars. Um, this presentation, uh, we're going to have two main speakers uh, who will be joined by the editor of the uh, Kremlin Influence Quarterly, uh, Anton Chekhovsov. Um, the two speakers are John Feistev, uh, who will analyze the political, economic, and geopolitical context of potential malign Russian influence in Norway, and Alexandra Yatsik, who will examine pro-Russian political forces and groups in France ahead of the 2022 presidential elections there. Um, if I can give a brief introduction of all of our esteemed guests, uh, Anton Shekhovsov is the senior fellow at the Free Russia Foundation and the director of the Center for Democratic Integrity in Austria. Uh, Alexandra is a visiting associate professor at Johann Skittel Institute of Political Studies, Tartu University, and a former fellow of the Free Russia Foundation. Uh, John Fersif is a Norwegian scholar and freelance journalist who's published books on conspiracy theories in Norway as well as the 2014 Ukrainian Revolution. His most recent book is called The Lighthouse in the East, Putin's Russia and Western Extremists. Um, and uh, I want to open, I think, first with Anton. So you have now, I forget how many of these quarterlies we've put out, um, but they're really kind of mammoth works. Uh, each one is a kind of book unto itself, uh, really doing a granular, in-depth analysis of uh, an issue that I think uh, all of us, certainly all of us, those who have attended this discussion in the past, uh, consider near and dear to our hearts, which is uh, how the Kremlin has instrumentalized essentially all, all aspects of uh, money, politics, uh, culture, et cetera, to um, propound its strategic interests in the West. So, Anton, what, what can you tell us about the, 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 the present report? I know there's a lot of interesting stuff here on Russian intelligence activities in Bulgaria, as I mentioned, uh, influence campaigns in France. Um, what distinguishes this report from previous efforts? Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And it's uh, again, it's a great pleasure to talk about the new issue of the Kremlin's Influence Quarterly. Uh, it's, the, it's the fourth issue already. Mm -hmm. um, although we are already collecting articles for the fifth one. Uh, so it's a uh, fourth issue. Uh, we have five essays um, on, on, on European uh, countries, on, uh, mostly on politics and media, because uh, we, we, d we identify several areas where we can see the Kremlin's malign influence uh, in Europe, but uh, this time we, we are focusing on two, on politics and, and media. So we have uh, Alisa Volkova, our author, and that's her already third contribution, or even fourth contribution, uh, to our to our journal. Uh, she writes about uh, espionage-related scandals in Bulgaria, and, and, and those uh, scandals are connected to Russia because um, one of the one of the main actors of those scandals is basically a, a Russian spy. Um, uh, uh, Volkova says that uh, despite the presence of Russian intelligence agents, um, and that it is basically open that Bulgaria has those agents uh, of, of uh, and uh, spies and agents of influence, uh, there is still this uh, lack of, or at least there has been a lack of response from the uh, Bulgarian authorities to, to the Russian espionage. And she says, she mentions, for example, that uh, in 2018, when most of the majority of EU countries decided to expel Russian diplomats in response to the poisoning of the Skripals in the UK, Bulgaria refused to show any solidarity. However, uh, when the Bulgarian authorities thought that, well, they need to somehow fight off corruption scandals in Bulgaria and, and, and present Bulgaria in the eyes of the EU as a responsible partner, they decided to suddenly disclose Russian espionage networks and acting upon them. Uh, so there is not only Russia is trying to weaponize everything, then we see that Bulgarian authorities and many authorities, many other countries, they are trying to um, 
instrumentalize uh, Russian influence to solve their own domestic problems. Then we have an essay by a uh, Ukrainian diplomat. Uh, uh, this essay is about, uh, is about the, uh, it's an analysis of statements made by Russian president. Uh, in Igor Lasovsky, the author of this essay, uh, he documents and analyzes the current policy, uh, pol uh, current policy, uh, foreign policy and military activities of the Russian Federation with a focus on Ukraine. He argues that there is uh, a new doctrine of limited sovereignty, or he refers to it as the Putin doctrine. Uh, Lasovsky says that uh, this policy, this doctrine, Putin doctrine, un is underpinned by five major domestic factors. The consolidation of the authoritarian regime domestically, so in Russia, uh, large-scale corruption at all levels, the use of energy and other natural resources to maintain domestic, political, and economic stability, and as a weapon of international influence, a powerful and a comprehensive propaganda machine, and the concept of legitimizing the use of Russian military force abroad to, in quotation, uh, uh, in uh, quotation marks, uh, to protect Russian speakers. So that's the uh, this essay. It's a bit unusual for uh, for our journal uh, to have a, a real diplomat, an acting diplomat, uh, a writing for us, but it's also a great honor. And also we have uh, an essay uh, written by a Lithuanian journalist, Vital, uh, Vital Jancis, uh, who looks at how Russia is increasingly uses Lithuanian media space. To, uh, to exert influence on the Lithuanian publics. And he says that there, it is a trend. This is not the same level of media engagement on the part of, the, of, the, of Russian actors. It's an increasing trend. So, for example, he, um, he says that the Kremlin's uh, main tools of influence in attempting to transform Lithuanian information environment include not only media registered in Russia, but also uh, a broad range of allegedly independent Russian outlets and experts, bloggers and influencers who actively disseminate pro-Kremlin narratives on social media. So some of these uh, influencers are based in Russia, but there are also those who are based in Lithuania itself. And uh, he concludes, uh, unfortunately, that uh, it's uh, quite a kind of a pessimistic conclusion that um, most likely in the future, not only Lithuania, but also the other two Baltic states, um, uh, Latvia and Estonia, uh, they will face a new wave of Putin incited information warfare with Russia. So that is, uh, in, uh, we also have uh, these uh, two essays by Alexander Yatsik and uh, John Fiasip, but uh, I, I think they will uh, speak for themselves. Yeah, and on that note, um, Alexander Yatsik, I want to turn to you. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating, fascinating contribution. contribution. Sorry? Yeah, so yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. sorry, I, there was a feedback. Um, I wanted to turn to you uh, about your contribution about Kremlin malign influence in the French elections. Uh, this year, more than most, I think, um, French politics has managed to um, percolate into the American mainstream um, in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, a series of New York Times articles about, you know, Macron being very um, sensitive to any kind of American criticism of his policies. There's a cultural debate about America now exporting its own cultural crises and you know, so-called wokeness to France. And then, of course, most recently, you know, this this major controversy over the uh, AUKUS um, coalition that has formed and the cancellation of a submarine deal with Australia. I wanted to um, ask you, where have the Russians sort of uh, kind of infiltrated or tried to manipulate or perhaps uh, amplify certain of, the, uh, of these debates or uh, you know, divisive issues uh, with respect to America and France. And then we can get into the more kind of detailed analysis of, of how domestically in France the politics is being kind of toyed with. Well, I think that uh, a good example of how Macron decided to be more 
look more friendly towards Russia is he is visiting at the opening of the uh, exhibition, which was uh, devoted to uh, Morozov collection, and uh, it was uh, came from uh, it was brought pro from Russia. So and the, this happened uh, exactly after this. Uh, a uh, problem with uh, United States, I mean, in terms of relations. So I think this is a good example of how uh, just visit uh, to kind of exhibition could uh, say uh, a little bit more about uh, their priorities. Uh, and uh, if uh, answering on your question about infiltration, about Russia's infiltration, into into France, I would say that the main uh, way, the main uh, the main target group um, is uh, French politicians, and uh, they are also the main lobbyists for Russian interests. Uh, so Russia tries to found uh, to find these uh, loyal uh, French politicians to Kremlin, uh, along with uh, representatives of the media, business, and also civil society. So, and in my report, I found uh, several examples of how Russia tries to use these uh, channels, these channels uh, for infiltration. Uh, and uh, definitely that uh, French elections of 2022 uh, uh, next year is very important uh, for, for Russia. And it's also a very critical event for France itself. Uh, because France uh, has been deeply affected by COVID uh, pandemic, and of course, uh, these, uh, French elections are also crucial for Moscow because uh, it is a very real chance to see a loyal candidate win the presidency. I mean, uh, Marine Le Pen, of course, and uh, we know uh, a well documented history of uh, relations uh, uh, Marine Le Pen with uh, the Kremlin. So if you're interested, I can to uh, be more specified in, in, this, in this regard. So um, I also looked at uh, media uh, and how uh, French uh, media are related with, um, uh, with the Kremlin. Uh, for instance, I analyzed uh, the very interesting case uh, which happened uh, on November 2019 when uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov uh, went on a working visit to France to participate in the Second Paris Peace Forum. And uh, it was a kind of meeting with uh, representatives of uh, French civil society. And interestingly, that after this meeting, uh, a photo was published in the uh, Twitter, uh, official Twitter account uh, of Lavrov. Or Russian foreign ministry, and the, the, which uh, helped identify the French, particip French participants. So I uh, tried to uh, analyze each of uh, history of each of uh, participant, and uh, try found uh, several interesting connections between them. Um, also, I looked at history, which is very important. Uh, uh, channel of uh, Russian-French relations, and uh, there is an interesting personage uh, in, in in France. Uh, his name is Pierre Malinowski, and he is known as a kind of French Indiana Jones, who tries to uh, somehow deal with uh, Russia through uh, organizing different uh, historical uh, events, which is not particularly focused on history, but mostly on kind of uh, I called it uh, necropolitical diplomacy. It means that he uh, deals with uh, memory and uh, all things that is important for, for, for Russia in terms of uh, identity building. And uh, Malinowski, for instance, is known uh, that he was, uh, uh, he had an idea to uh, transfer uh, the age, age of, um, uh, Napoleon uh, general uh, to, to Russia uh, and uh, he also has a lot of other uh, projects if you're interested I also can talk uh, about them. Um, my uh, third or, sec uh, or fourth case was um, uh, Russia's uh, vaccine diplomacy 
and also Kremlin attacks um, in terms of uh, cyber security. And in this sense, it would be a, a very interesting example. For instance, uh, on February uh, 15 this year, uh, the French National Agency for Information System Security announced a massive attempt to hack into software uh, of the company Centrion, which is uh, a, a big, uh, uh, big company, which uh, clients include, for instance, Airbus, Air France, or also French Ministry of Justice. And uh, this uh, hacker attack was similar to uh so-called the sandworm hacker group and uh, also similar to other uh which could be uh, le led by by russian uh russian groups so i would say that all these uh all these cases uh, happened uh, this year on uh, last year so if you are interested in the specification of these cases i could uh, give more details so cyber uh, cyber security history elections and media i'm absolutely interested in in the relationship between le pen uh, and the russian government i mean one of the things that that strikes me as interesting is given macron's posturing in the last several years you know this this sort of uh, outreach or attempted reconciliation with moscow on a host of uh, issues including cybersecurity counterterrorism um, one of the things that I think has driven a wedge between Paris and Washington, it doesn't seem like the, the that the Kremlin um, is is particularly lacking in this year's e election landscape. In terms of, I mean, you know, even if Macron wins re-election, it's not the end of the world for them. It's not a, a terrible thing. But they also have now, you know, a, a, a far right candidate, two far right candidates, right, to choose from. Can you go into a little into the specifics of the relationship between? Uh, Le Pen and and Putin as of today. Yes, if you look just uh, the recent poll, a poll for, uh, which uh, was conducted in October, uh, the between 15 and 18 October, you will see that Macron has <clears throat> 23 percent of voters, and uh, uh, Le Pen uh, has just uh, 16 percent. Which, uh, as you said, uh, doesn't mean that uh, Kremlin lacks. Uh, uh, all influence uh, on, on, on Le Pen. But if you are talking about uh, the relations between Le Pen and, and the Kremlin, uh, it is not secret that uh, in 2014, Marine uh, Le Pen parties uh, took uh, a loan uh, of uh, 9 million euros from, uh, from, from Russia, from uh, Russian first uh, Czech Russian bank. Um, it is uh, still uh, she has still this loan and uh, she she has to pay uh, also uh, the the party's financial situation is kind of complicated uh, she has no money for for her campaign um, interesting fact that uh, on may this year uh, her niece uh, mario marichal visited moscow to celebrate a uh, victory days and the interesting fact here that this event was largely ignored by other any foreign leaders uh, except the Tajik president, Imam Ali Rahman. So, and of course, if we uh, can somehow interpret the situation in this context, uh, it is obvious that Marichal's trip was uh, kind of reminiscent of uh, the time uh, her aunt uh, traveled to Moscow uh, at the height of her 2017 president campaign. And also um, uh, in uh, her interview, I mean, Le Marine Le Pen this year already uh, said that, um, uh, again, it's necessary to lift sanctions against uh, Russia. Uh, so she supported uh, Russia again. Uh, if we look again at... Um, mm, those who uh, could uh, vote for, for Le Pen, for instance. So we will see that uh, interesting uh, shift uh, uh, among those who, for instance, can support uh, Macron uh, uh, because uh, it seems to be that Le Pen's uh, policy uh, be become uh, more 
uh, I would say less uh, radicalized uh, and less uh, far, uh, far right oriented. So uh, part of uh, electorate which could uh, support Macron could uh, vote for, for Le Pen, for instance. Uh, also, there is an interesting um, uh, personage uh, close to Le Pen, uh, Thierry Mariani, and uh, you know him very well. And uh, Mariani also an interesting, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, agent of uh, Russia's influence in France and uh, he uh, he's known uh, widely known he's uh, visiting uh, Russia as a so-called observer during uh, regional elections in 2017 uh, 2018 uh, 2020 and also this year and uh, surprisingly that uh, despite all these uh, uh, relations with Russia, Mariani retains uh, his seat in the European Parliament, uh, where he's a member of the Identity and Democracy Group, and uh, he potentially could, uh, could promote uh, Putin's interest in, 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 in the European Parliament. So, uh, even despite uh, Le Pen will not win uh, the president elections, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, Kremlin will not win uh, their uh, votes in, in, in Russia. So, and I would say that France is deeply infiltrated uh, into uh, friendships uh, towards Russia. So I would say that there is no kind of um, such uh, vaccine against uh, Russia's influence that, for instance, uh, has Estonia, Poland or Georgia. And if you look, for instance, at media, at uh, RT, formerly Russia Today, uh, Russia Today is the only media that continue broadcasting uh, and has a uh, TV broadcast in, in, in Europe, in France. So there is no any kind of broadcasting, no, uh, neither in Germany, nor in, in other uh, European countries. So this uh, tells us something about uh, relations between Russia and, and, and France. Thank you. Um, uh, John, I wanted to turn to you. Um, you don't really hear much about Russian infiltration or influence peddling in Norway. Um, I'm hoping you can give us a kind of tour de horizon of the situation in that country. Well, first of all, uh, Norway is a very different place than, uh, than France in many ways. Uh, First of all, I guess we could start somewhere. Norway is a country with a very low level of political polarization, I would say. Uh, there is also a very high level of public trust in Norway, meaning trust in each other, trust in uh, the government, trust in politicians, in the media, and so forth. And I think all of this together uh, means that there is little room to play upon for, well, conspiracy theorists and disinformation and all of that. And uh, also, Norway is a country which is very, very staunchly, well, Atlantic in its orientation. I mean, the vast majority support continued uh, NATO membership, uh, even, even, even among part voters for parties who are very much against NATO. Uh, there is, of course, uh, we are not an EU country, and uh, at the moment, the majority does not want to join the EU either. So there, you could say there, there is a slightly more let's say, lack of agreement. I would really call it polarization. So, uh, the, what, what we see in Norway is far less than in France, obviously, when it comes to, well, disinformation. And uh, because there is less to play upon, really, I would say. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess we could start by... Uh, we could start by... We can start by saying that what I've been looking into here is the Norwegian alternative media, which landscape, which I found the most interesting, actually. Norwegian uh, alternative media landscape is dominated by, well, let's say three or four uh, companies or websites. I guess company websites would be better than companies uh, called Reset, Reset, Steigan, and uh, Rights and Document. 
and uh, a smaller one called Herland Report. And uh, I've chosen to come to focus on uh, Steigan and to a lesser extent Herland and uh, Reset, since they are the ones where you can find traces of a pro-Kremlin message. To start somewhere, uh, I guess the most important one here would be uh, would be Steigan. It is uh, a web page run by uh, uh, Paul Steigan, who is a former leader of the of a small communist party of the 1970s that was actually actually became quite influential, even though they never had any political support, because so many of its members would rather would later go on to have careers in trade unions, in academia, media and so forth. So their influence and their role in history has been far bigger than their actual political influence, which means that more people will also be concerned with what Paul Steigon is doing than if he had been the leader of another minuscule sect. This web page, uh, it had about uh, over a million interactions uh, last year, which is quite a lot. With interactions, I mean sharing in social media, I mean clicking on links, clicking of likes and so forth. This is a web page that is, uh, let's call it very, very anti-elitistic, but especially when it comes to global elites. It is very anti-EU, anti-US, anti-NATO, anti-George Soros and all, uh, and all of that. They uh, tend to, even though they don't use that word, they tend to be very, very much believing that there is some kind of uh, hidden power elite that is trying to run the world uh, and, well, working to uh, maintain a Western or American um, hegemony. Because of this, uh, Steigon uh, believes, uh, seems to believe that all uprisings all over the world that are not, at least if they're not direct against the US supported regime, they, will, they are always attempts of regime change. They are not authentic. That will include, for instance, the Arab Spring, it will include the, the Rose Revolution in Georgia, it will include the Orange Revolution and later the Euromaidan. And of course, also know the attempted uh, what the attempted yeah, attempted revolution in Belarus, and of course, also the Russian opposition, like uh, Navalny and others, would also be considered part of this. They have very many articles that are very, very critical about uh, human rights and democracy organizations, which they see as uh, tools for for the international powers and tools for the West. And of course, because of this, they are also, uh, they seem to have at least uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend view at uh, Putin's Russia. Uh, many articles are uh, supporting, for instance, Russia's uh, policy in uh, annexing the Crimea. They would be very, very against the Euromaidan. They would say that this was the West trying to tear Ukraine away from uh, Ru Russia. They would uh, deny that there was an attempt at poisoning Navalny. They would deny the Skripal's case and actually claiming that it was more likely that Ukraine was behind it because they wanted to destroy the good relationship between uh, Russia and Britain. And uh, also, you can see that there is also an element of anti-immigration in uh, Steigon, although not from a racist point of view, but more like that Immigration is a result of Western meddling in other countries, uh, and uh, this is what the EU and NATO does, and therefore we should not support them, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I guess the most interesting thing here was how they would cover the war in Syria, because uh, when they did that, they would rely both very much on uh, Russia Today and, and Sputnik News, but also upon uh, several actors from the international conspiracy scene, more or less. Uh, I mean, as you might know, uh, when it come to, came to selling their war in Syria, uh, Russia or RT recruited several people from uh, the conspiracy scene, which were uh, given the role of journalist, expert, and so on. They were allowed to travel to Syria to do uh, reportages, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, many of the same people were relied upon in the coverage by Steigan. They were also given... Uh, Steigl even, even held a conference where those people were uh, kind of the guests of honor and the main speakers. Uh, you do have uh, something similar at uh, Reset. Uh, Reset is a bit different. That is, um, that is a very anti-immigrant, nationalistic, right-wing webpage. 
uh, I would say, with a very nasty tendency to do personal attacks on people they don't like. But also there, you have had some articles that, uh, like criticizing American meddling in the Middle East, criticize American meddling in Belarus, and so on and so on. So you have the same there. And those articles are usually written by the same people who are uh, can be interviewed as expert by Steigan and other uh, similar web pages. This, I would say, is the main part place where this information goes on in Norway. Although I would like to add that I'm not saying that these people, I'm not accusing these people of, let's say, being paid by Russia and so forth. Uh, I have absolutely no proof of saying that. So whether they are uh, transmitting Russian or appropriate narrative uh, deliberately or because they just believe in it, I, I don't know. Uh, but I don't want to do any accusations based on things I don't know. But still, Steigon and to some lesser extent uh, Reset are probably the main uh, channels of a pro criminal narrative in, to Norway in very many instances. Then, of course, you have the mainstream media. Now, the Norwegian mainstream media has usually been very, very, I would say, be rather good at not, uh, not transmitting false narratives. Uh, you have, have had a few instances where one newspaper in particular called Classic Com Company uh, did more or less a similar narrative to, on the Ukraine revolution as uh, you found from Russia. Recently, they uh, an, an article would uh, be saying that, oh, but everybody, why are the, everyone in the West talking about the military exercises uh, in Belarus and not about uh, NATO doing exercises uh, on another country's soil in Ukraine without mentioning that, well, Ukraine has been attacked by Russia, so it give, makes it sort of a different situation. And they were also in the same article kind of very positive to uh, Hungary's uh, gas deal with Russia and so forth. But I think this is more sense of omissions. It's not uh, on the same scale as you found in alternative media. And of course, finally, you have uh, Norwegians who uh, contribute to uh, a pro Kremlin narrative elsewhere, which is not particularly directed against uh, a Norwegian audience. For instance, uh, I mean, some weeks ago, you had... Uh, uh, Geir Uglan Jakobsen, who is the leader of uh, a small party called Demokraterna, meaning the Democrats, uh, which is a tiny anti-immigration right-wing right-wing populist party that is to the right of the Progress Party, if you know about the Progress Party. They managed to get, like, let's say, 1% of the voters uh, in, the, in the recent election. But uh, he was like, he had this opinion piece that was published in uh, RT uh, about how it was so important, how he was fighting against, uh, well, the exportation of the woke revolution to Norway and that sort of things. And I suspect that the audience for this was not the Norwegian audience. It was uh, an international audience that was sort of supposed to see that, look, there are people in Norway also who support, uh, who support us now and who are... And I mean, they also had an article in the same about the same day, uh, speaking about uh, the recent uh, Norwegian election and calling it a victory for the same forces as you see in Hungary and uh, Poland. And I guess that the, I guess that the, the new government of Norway would rather disagree with that characterization. Okay. But I mean, you have several other actors like this that will, will contribute internationally, uh, but are not very well known in Norway, uh, including attempts at uh, slandering Norway's uh, child welfare services as being run by pedophiles and so on. You have Nor Norwegians contributing to that as well. Can I can I just interject? Yeah, are, they, are these media outlets that you've been referring to, do you see them as sort of auditioning in a way for perhaps greater... Uh, Russian government support, or, or you mentioned like they're catering to an audience that's not necessarily a domestic organic audience in Norway. They're trying to telegraph the fact that, look, there's this kind of contingent of um, deeply conservative, anti-establishment um, people living in this country. Is that is that for its own sake or is that there's some kind of mercenary goal there? 
Okay, first of all, maybe I was I spoke a bit too fast. The, the outlets I've been talking about are in Norwegian and directed towards the Norwegian audience. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I finally said that there are also Norwegians who are uh, taking part in international uh, international uh, influence influencing, which are probably not very well known in Norway. Uh, yeah, I guess that would be uh, one explanation that they are catering to an audience. I mean. You uh, at least you have one uh, person who is a professor at a Norwegian university who uh, regularly has columns at RT. Obviously, this is sort of his. I wouldn't call it his job because I don't know if he gets paid for it. But to him, obviously, this is an important thing he does. When it comes to this politician I spoke of, uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I because I don't. Uh, I don't know what he's thinking. But it might also be, of course, that he just. Oh, great! I, I'm getting. Uh, I'm being offered to write an op-ed at an international broadcaster. Uh, this is. This is. This is good. Obviously, but yeah, yeah. I, but I guess the message would be catering to an international audience uh, there. It would be saying that, yeah, look, there are this conservative current also in Norway, definitely. Um, I wanted to open the discussion into um, areas that we we haven't looked at yet, but I, I know that are kind of hovering around the periphery, I suppose, of this report. Uh, and before the we went live, I, I was discussing with Anton uh, Nord Stream Two and its attendant agonies, both in Europe and now increasingly in Washington, uh, there was a kind of befuddled response. You know, President Biden, when he was candidate Biden, campaigned on being opposed to Nord Stream 2. Uh, Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, during his confirmation hearing, said that, that this was something absolutely the administration opposed. And then there was that sort of bombshell announcement that there's going they're going to waive sanctions on the German company responsible for completing the construction, the CEO of which is Matthias Warneg, who, I mean, is, is kind of a double threat. And then not only was he a former Stasi officer, but he was also personally recruited to the KGB by Vladimir Putin when he was a case officer in Dresden. Uh, Anton, I mean, you're, you're in the heart of, um, uh, shall we say, Putin Vesteher Europe in Vienna. Can you, can you give a sense of what's going on now? Given the, uh, the the ascendant uh, energy crisis and and sort of the the inevitable uh, price manipulation that everyone knew was going to happen and has indeed come to pass. Yeah, if you remember before the COVID pandemic, uh, before you know the, the virus hit uh, the entire world, the Free Russia Foundation was engaged in a series of events trying to show to the international community and most importantly to the EU and the US that Nord Stream 2 poses a threat to the, uh, it, it basically it's, it's a security threat for Europe. And of course, some people would believe us, uh, but also many people would say, well, no, Nord Stream 2, it's only a business project. It's, it's purely economical. You know, there is nothing, there is no political aspect uh, to Nord Stream 2. Well, in the end, eventually, unfortunately, we turned out to be right. And now we see that uh, the prices went up. Uh, not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily a Russia's fault that they went up. Although I think one, one, um, uh, one could say that, uh, that, that there is a contribution on the Russia's side to the price hikes, to the, insta to the unstable uh, gas prices. But most importantly, uh, Russia has recently made very, very clear that it could increase uh, supplies, gas supplies to Europe, but only in exchange of the of the approval of the European approval for Nord Stream 2. So we already see now, even before Nord Stream 2 is uh, has become, you know, like a live, uh, it, it is now already being used as a political weapon against the EU. So we, 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 we see this and uh, in some countries where that's uh, especially those which are dependent on Russian gas, uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the households, if they hold elections, then these gas prices 
uh, or increasing gas prices, they will play a role. So these, uh, this, the, this crisis is not very, um, well, it's not beneficial to the incumbents, and especially in those countries, again, that are dependent on, on Russian gas supplies. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a question to both uh, uh, Alexandra and John. And I, 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 I meant to ask about the, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, the editor of the Russian newspaper, uh, Novaya Gazeta, Muratov, whether, uh, whether you followed uh, responses in the, say, in the French or in the Norwegian alternative media, in the French uh, you know, opposition media or uh, on those blogs or, or, or Telegram channels anywhere. What are the reactions? If, if you, if you saw anything. Well, I guess in the alternative media I spoke of, there is some talk about uh, that uh, the pr price is being used to be, to build a, uh, like a picture, uh, to continue painting a picture of Russia as the enemy. So that, and that it's uh, politically motivated. And you, uh, obviously, you will also have some voices saying that, why didn't, uh, why didn't uh, Yulena Sange get it instead? Uh, but uh, again, we're talking. We are we're we're deep into the alternative media landscape and social media here. We are not. Uh, this is not something you find in mainstream. But among the landscape I depicted of the alternative media, you will have a lot of this. First of all, that uh, this is part of creating a, an image of Russia as the enemy, and second, why not give it to Assange instead? Alexandra, you're, you're still yeah, muted. So, sorry, yeah. um, I actually didn't follow uh, very deeply in this topic, but I, I know that uh, the mainstream media uh, were actually friendly towards this Nobel Prize uh, winner. Uh, and as John said, it was also kind of uh, um, jokes um, about this Nobel Prize uh, on, on literature. But at, at the same time, so I mean, they're kind of friendly. So, But I didn't fall deeply into the um right far right uh, media kind of rt or sputnik news or something french french media i think it was it was an interesting discussion though because um well there were several pieces uh leonid bershitsky in the washington post uh, followed by the new york times about how um giving it to muratov was in a way, the kind of uh, a compliment to compromise in Putin's Russia, right? I mean, Novaya Gazeta is not as independent and fearless as it once was. Uh, and in fact, I think the Russian government congratulated him on receiving the prize, right? Which was itself a bit of a, a tell. Um, Anton, I put it actually back to you. I'm, I'm keen to hear your perspective on this. Uh, was this... Was this uh, you know, sort of uh, a, an unmitigated uh, victory for independent uh, oppositional journalism in Russia, or was this something a bit more muddled? Well, I think that um, I don't, well, you know, I was following the discussion, but mostly from sort of Russian perspective. Well, Russian, by Russian, I, I mean more or less liberal uh, Russian influencers and bloggers and of course uh, probably you missed that but there was a huge fight uh, between people who uh, think that the Nobel Peace Prize should have gone to Navalny to Alexei Navalny instead of Muratov uh, who uh, the the editor of Novaya Gazeta and there was a lot of uh, um, I'd say that so many people thought that Muratov was not worthy uh, of of the prize. That he was very too often he would uh, well somehow agree with not not necessarily with the Kremlin, but people who are sort of friendly towards the Kremlin or uh, so sort of so called system liberals and system liberals in Russia. Those are liberals that are uh, allowed to exist. Uh, prominently in the media space. So I, I was following this fight. And um, um, as, as it usually happens, Russian liberals, uh, they tend to destroy each other 
and and weaken uh, the positions of the uh, liberal idea in general in the Russian context. So I I I remember last year, uh, but that is something different. I remember last year Thierry Mariani, whom Alexandra mentioned in her in her talk. He was writing uh, quite actively about Alexei Navalny. Uh, and if you remember France and Germany, those were the countries that were sort of main uh, um, main vehicles, main um, uh, uh, proponents of the new sanctions, in, uh, of, the, uh, of imposing new sanctions against Russia for the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. And Thierry Marini, uh, was actively writing that there is no proof that that Putin's regime tried to uh, poison Navalny, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we see that some of these people, yeah, that who we refer to as agents of the Kremlin influence, uh, or at least useful idiots, at the very least, uh, they are repeating the same narratives that uh, that the Kremlin media uh, are propagating. And I'm sure in many cases, this is not just, you know, a, a coincidence that they decided to write these pieces or say those arguments, pronounce those arguments. This is something that is being sent to them, not necessarily, you know, the drafts or texts, but, you know, sort of ideas. Well, could you please, you know, write about this? Could you cover this topic? You know, it's important for us in order to create... Uh, uh, probably only for the Russian domestic audience to create a feeling that well, not not everybody in the West agrees with the these uh, you know uh, with his uh, uh, plot, so-called plot against Russia, with his Russophobic uh, commentators and Russophobic Brussels and Washington, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have this uh, for, for sure. And Michael, if I may just add something, I think that Anton is re actually very, very right, saying that there is a kind of uh, uh, attempt to create a feeling that somewhere, someone uh, uh, in, in France, uh, abroad, Russia, in Europe, support uh, the Kremlin's uh, narrative. Because if you look at uh, the influence of RT, for instance, in France, in Germany, uh, in in, in uh, in UK, uh, its influence is re uh, really marginal. So I don't think that uh, RT influenced uh, on uh, on uh, the electorate in those countries and somehow is uh, able to to influence on the elections. And uh, despite the huge budget that RT spent on on this uh, propaganda and, and producing narratives and huge salaries. Uh, which RT pays to French or Norwegian, or, I don't know, or uh, UK uh, journalists, uh, there is no actually any influence on, 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 on the audience, on the local audience. I guess you can sort of have the feeling that what they are, uh, that their audience is, uh, it's not very big in any specific country, but it's, it's quite, it might be so quite big transnational, but not enough to influence the general attitude in any country in particular. I don't know. We, we do have a, a few questions here. I think you're sort of addressed one of them, but uh, John to you, um, someone is asking about the role the communist party of Norway plays in pushing pro Kremlin narratives in Norway. Uh, then I guess we will have to uh, define what we mean by the Communist Party. I will assume that what they mean is a party called the uh, Rött, meaning red. I would argue that yes, it started out as uh, it started out originally in the seventies as this as a minuscule communist sect called the uh, AKP ML, which was incidentally the one that Paul Steigan, uh, the blogger, used to be the leader of. But it's been over the years, it changed more and more and more. It went through many uh, incarnations, and it is today a party that really had its big breakthrough now. But I would not call it, I don't think I would call it a communist party anymore. If it's communist, it's a very, very mild form of it. I would call it a, I would call it a left socialist uh, party that is democratic uh, in all ways and just had a big breakthrough. Uh, what was the question? What was the role in what? The role in pushing pro-Kremlin narrative. Yeah, that's interesting. I would say that the party in general uh, 
does not. Uh, well, okay, I would say that there has been a few incidents, like some, a few like op-eds in newspapers and so on, uh, by members of the party, even, and which could be seen to be what would be in German called Putin Verstehr. But I would not. I would not necessarily say that that reflects the main position of the party as such. Uh, and there are also members of the party that has been uh, inviting. Uh, I would say rather nasty people from the conspiracy propaganda sphere to he to held uh, to lecture and so forth. Uh, but again, this has been like local chapters in some small village, and not you know not the not the party as such. And you could also guess that Steigon has some re has a few readers in uh, the party as well. So I would say that because of their anti-imperialist tradition, because of their uh, staunch anti-NATO, anti-EU uh, attitude, there is always a chance that some in some elements in the party could be sort of like. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? It could be sort of like uh, ending up retransmitting Russian propaganda or be or or believing it in some way. But I think we should be talking about uh, a danger to specific members and not to the party as such. Uh, there are some things here and there. I mean, there are some stories here and there that could be talked about, but they're always about like. There was this person who, yeah, he had some kind of position in the party who did this and this and this, but he did not do it on behalf of the party, if you see what I mean. So I would not say that they have a role as such in uh, transmitting Russian propaganda. Um, if that, that was an answer. I, I think that's pretty comprehensive, yeah. Uh, Anton, I, I'm wondering too, um, we discussed the, the French, upcoming French elections, but what about uh, German elections and the kind of political calculus in, in Berlin? Um, you know, the, the rise of the Green Party there seems to be kind of interesting because clearly they have a very staunch opposition to Nord Stream 2 and therefore are seen as, as particularly more anti-Kremlin than, than most other actors. Can you give us a a lay of the land in Germany? Well, I think with the Green Party, much of its um, sort of anti-Kremlin um, uh, posture, at, at, at the very least, it comes from its own ideological foundation. So uh, they believe that um, you know, Nord Stream 2 uh, is not environmentally friendly. Uh, they, of course, there, there is this political element, and now we see that the leader of the party is quite critical of uh, Russia's attempts to weaponize Nord Stream 2 and weaponize the crisis, the, the uh, gas crisis in Europe. But I think most of it comes from um, this, again, this uh, anti kremlin positions, they are mostly underpinned by the ideological considerations, which are you know, green. Uh, sort of center left, uh, center left positions. We still, well, you know, the coalition is in the making. Uh, there is no coalition government, yes, uh, yet. Uh, but of course, uh, it's uh, uh, the Green Party leader being in charge of the Ministry of for Foreign Foreign Affairs is bad news for the Kremlin. That's that's for sure. Also, the inclusion of the Liberal Party, uh, Free Democrats, uh, is not is not a good news uh, for Russia either. Although uh, Free Democrats are not as um, you know they are not as staunch uh, uh, in in their criticism of the Kremlin uh, compared to the Green Party. So um, the hopefully coming. Um, coalition government, including the Social Democrats, uh, the Green Party, and Free Free Democrats, uh, will well. Hopefully, it will probably correct some mistakes that uh, were made by the previous uh, government led by uh, uh, Merkel. I could add that we, since we've been talking about energy and energy crisis, uh, there is actually something very interesting going on right there now in Norway. Uh, because uh, it seems like you have a wave of Euroscepticism coming up now, uh, very much to, around the energy packages and the energy uh, treaties and the Acer Euro. 
which is has which there is a lot of resistance against now in Norway because uh, many people believe that they are to blame for uh, Norway's increased uh, export of uh, and electricity, which is then said to be the reason for uh, higher prices. And of course, this is something that actually hits the wallets of people directly. So it's reasonable that people get angry. But uh, if you look at Facebook groups that are uh, about resisting Acer, resisting the energy package, you see that there is uh, a lot of material being shared from uh, pro Kremlin alternative media, and you see, uh, and also even some articles from RT. And obviously, they are trying to paint the picture there, or at least. Um, inflate the picture that this is all the EU's fault, that uh, electricity prices are going up in Norway, and we should withdraw from the, our association agreement and so forth. And you have even this Steig on webpage uh, almost calling for uh, like, a, like an uprising against the high uh, electricity prices. So that's something that could get interesting, because I think that here you might actually have a, a new angle that... Uh, affects people in a way that uh, earlier things or earlier cases have not. Um, one of the things we mentioned earlier in the, the discussion was uh, Russian intelligence interference in Bulgaria. Um, I've done a bit of reporting on the Emilian Gebrev case, which is fascinating. And the only reason there was any headway made in that is because of Skripal, right? I mean, it was sort of we're now looking backwards at the activities of GRU unit 29155, what they got up to over the course of the last decade. Uh, and it does indeed seem that that operatives from that unit poisoned Gibrev with a Novichok-like substance uh, in 2015. Um, what would you say, and I put this to anybody, uh, unfortunately, the, the author of the Bulgaria section, well, no, John, I think you, you, you wrote about this to some degree in the report. What would you say is, is the biggest issue now in Sofia? Is it just a political reluctance to escalate or, or accuse the Kremlin of all sorts of, I mean, we're not just talking about an attempted assassination, but state terrorism, right? Sabotage uh, operations conducted on Bulgarian soil, the blowing up of EMCO factories and weapons manufacturing plants, which the Office of the Prosecutor General also alleged was conducted by Russian intelligence operatives. Yet there seems to be no forward momentum here. Uh, the Gibrev investigation has been suspended. I don't think any, apart from one Russian quote unquote diplomat being expelled from the embassy in Sofia, there, there hasn't been any other kind of action. What, what, what's taking place in Bulgaria? I do not really know this uh, case that well, so I think I'll just pass it on to somebody else. Well, in my opinion, uh, the uh, the sabotage in Bulgaria that was uh, that that's not really part of uh, political warfare. I know the Kremlin's political warfare against Bulgaria. This is part of the very real war uh, between. Well, this is a part of the very real military aggression of Russia against Ukraine. So the uh, uh, there that's. Uh, uh, weapons in Bulgaria were destroyed in order for them not to appear uh, in Ukraine on the Ukrainian side. Uh, the same, the, the same for uh, uh, the, the 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 Czech Republic. So it's not it's not political warfare. It's you know very real military sabotage. Mm -hmm. And I think the the uh, the inquiry into uh, into these. Uh, uh, assassination attempts, they may be reopened. And I'm being very cynical here. Once the Bulgarian authorities think that uh, they somehow need to show that they are responsible uh, partners in NATO or in the EU, and when they are criticized for maybe for some corruption uh, in Bulgaria, they will reopen this case to show, well, look, we are indeed fighting against uh, uh, Russian uh, Russian malign operations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is this instrumentalization of the fight against Russian malign, malign Russian influence, and uh, I wouldn't say, well, this case is forgotten. It it may be reopened at some point when the well again when the Bulgarian authorities think that it is useful for them. 
Okay. Um, well, we've reached an hour. I mean, I, I haven't got any further questions to ask of any of you, but if, if there are any sort of concluding thoughts or, or comments you'd like to We share. do have questions by in the uh, from the audience. Oh, I see. There's one more. There, there. was one question yeah. for Alexandra. Um, yes, let me see. Uh, what is going on? What RT about... broadcast in France? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so the question is, can you clarify regarding RT's broadcast in France? What did you mean by saying that they have more freedom there compared to other countries of the European Union? Yes, I just meant that uh, it is possible to, uh, has, to have a TV broadcast in France because since 2017, uh, it is allowed to uh, have a TV broadcast in France. And uh, when Russia today tried to uh, launch its broadcasting uh, via Luxembourg uh, to Germany this year. Germany banned it, so it wasn't possible to do so. It means that when you switch uh, on your TV uh, in France, for instance, you can see this uh, Russia TV icon, so you can just uh, see it on uh, watching on TV. And uh, it, it is not possible to do so in, in other countries, so let's say in Germany and in the UK and, and in, uh, in Italy, etc. So you can watch uh, Russia Today only uh, from uh, its website, and etc. Mm. So in France, it's possible to watch it uh, on TV immediately. There's a follow-up to Yeah, the but only on cable TV. It's only cable TV. Only if you have cable, you can watch uh, RT France. Anyway, yes, yes. You, you can watch it only on cable TV, yes, it's right. The, the... I think in Norway, it's completely... It's... I don't think any cable provider is uh, provided, to put it like that. But, uh, of course, if you want to watch it uh, online, you're you're free to do that. Sputnik actually attempted to do a Norwegian version some, uh, I think it was four or five years ago, but it uh, lasted for a lot more, not much more than a year. I think it was considered a failure and just folded. Um, the follow-up to this is uh, what is the situation with other Russian state-funded channels other than RT, such as In the Now and Redfish, which have reached a massive audience and are able to basically promote the West bad Russia good picture while not explicitly being pro-Russian? Why are these channel who why are these channels and who funds them getting so little attention, even though they're more than just a liberal version of RT? Um, I can only tell you about the, uh, the Kremlin state, uh, the Kremlin media in, for instance, in, 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 uh, in Europe. And uh, if you actually do not produce uh, the picture, exactly pro-Kremlin picture, it doesn't mean that uh, this is not a part of uh, pro-Kremlin uh, narrative, because uh, if we look at the strategy that used by uh, Russia, to, uh, Russia Today in France, for instance, in Germany, this is not the uh, direct propaganda of, of, of the Kremlin, of Russia. So this is a kind of uh, narrative that uh, criticizes uh, the governments, uh, the current uh, situation in the countries. And uh, uh, this is not exactly the bad picture of uh, Russia or good picture of Russia, this is a bad picture of Europe. And uh, interestingly, uh, even despite uh, Margarita Simonian uh, constantly boasting of uh, uh, extremely high ranks of, of uh, Russia Today and all, all other state-funded uh, uh, channels, it doesn't mean again that they are really uh, watched by by the audience. So, and if you look at um, a number of investigations by, for instance, uh, Navalny's uh, team or uh, by other uh, European uh, investigators, you can see that uh, this traffic uh, is inflated by, uh, for instance, uh, Indian bots or only via porno sites on uh, by uh, Russian trolls. So it doesn't mean that uh, people watch uh, these, these TVs, these, these channels. So these just numbers. And uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting technique how to um, try to uh, show this picture that people uh, like, like these channels. So this is not the truth. There's a, another question for Alexandra. Um, 
there was some press in France about a so-called NGO named ironically FBI. Um, it contacted French media to propose to give some quotes on police violence, et cetera. If you go to the website of this NGO, you can see that they're explicitly say that they're supported by, um, I think they mean Prigozhin, but they've misspelled the name. Why uh, is, in, in, in your opinion, uh, is, is a question of influence not as much uh, exert to exert influence on France as to make the world believe that Russia is influential? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't know well about this case, so probably, I don't know, Anton, do, do you know something about that? So. Yeah, I think that there was a report in Le Monde um, about uh, Prigozhin structures uh, reaching out to French journalists and French journalist organizations and um, um, inviting them uh, to a project that would cover police violence in France. And police violence in France is actually uh, quite a real thing. Uh, during the Gilets Jaunes uh, protest, Yellow Vest uh, protest, during the uh, anti-Macron uh, protest, during the protest against the health pass, uh, police, uh, French police, uh, behaved quite well, quite violently, so to say. Um, during the Gilets Jaunes uh, protest, even some people uh, died. So this is a problem uh, in the French society. It's an it's a, it's a internal problem of the French society, which Russia is trying to aggravate, to exploit it, uh, to amplify the anti-police, anti-government uh, messages and create uh, chaos, uh, create uh, more troubles for, for Macron. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a tactic that is... Uh, uh, has been used uh, by by uh, by uh, by the Kremlin many times before. Uh, I think it is considered to be an efficient tactic. And uh, what is quite interesting here is that uh, Prigozhin structures they acted well um, quite openly. And this is very, very strange. If you look at other Prigozhin's operations in Africa, in, in Ukraine, he has always uh, tried to make, to, to, to make those operations as covert as possible, as secret as possible. But here we have an, op an, an almost open um, attempt to engage French journalists into a uh, Russian malign influence operation. So th this is surprising. And this is surprising, again, uh, that Prigozhin, uh, well, he's a smart guy. Yeah? Uh, he's, he's not some stupid uh, idiot uh, who is trying different things to, to see what, what's going to work. Most of, uh, most of the things that he does, they are very efficient. They're quite successful. But here, uh, knowing that Prigozhin himself and Prigozhin's name and his structures are quite toxic in Europe. It is, again, uh, really weird, I would say, that he decided to act so openly uh, in, in the French context. So I would just add this, if possible, that this is not the, I mean, the, the, the last uh, attempt to somehow infiltrate uh, French uh, audience in terms of uh, disinformation, for instance, uh, uh, in May this year, uh, it was also a quite open attempt uh, to uh, spread the disinformation about vaccine, uh, Pfizer particular, which is recognized in Europe. And this is a very typical strategy used by uh, Kremlin uh, agents, uh, for instance, by Russia today and also Sputnik and also Kremlin outlets. And uh, interestingly, that this time, this attempt to spread this information was uh, done through uh, bloggers, through French language, uh, YouTube, uh, very popular blogger. Uh, this attempt wasn't uh, successful because uh, blogger, uh, his name is Leo Grasse, uh, he uh, recognized this as a disinformation and uh, uh, said uh, about uh, the, the situation and uh, made uh, this public and also uh, uh, published uh, an investigation about the case. Uh, so it was very interesting uh, attempt to act very openly again. 
uh, and and probably this is not uh, a typical uh, a typical strategy that was used before. Also in Norway, I mean, you have the Kremlin-friendly blog I'll be talking about, uh, which also, of course, went on a very very anti anti COVID or anti COVID measure uh, policy, like uh, very much against face masks, very much against. Uh, lockdown vaccines and so on and even actually the owner even took part in uh, in uh, demonstrations and spoke yeah well i mean prigozhin's operations in europe have become more brazen over time the more he's um sort of turned into a pariah the, the more daring he he becomes i mean i reported on this baltic sea region initiative which was essentially founded in berlin seemingly anodyne, designed to have discussions with the uh, European stakeholders on the circular economy, post-COVID recovery, et cetera. But the whole thing was fronted by the St. Petersburg, quote unquote, back office. Um, and uh, this was a, uh, this was all run by people. This wasn't trolls. This wasn't, you know, social media gaming. This was a human influence operation. So it seems like, yeah, he's, he's kind of taken the gloves off despite sanctions and international obloquy. Um, well, listen, we, it's now 11.11, 11, so we've gone past the hour. Uh, I don't see any more questions from the audience. Uh, do, does any of you or do, do all of you have any kind of concluding remarks to make? I would just want to probably advertise uh, our journal and uh, invite uh, other experts and academics and journalists to contribute to the uh, following issues uh, uh, of the Kremlin's Influence uh, Journal. So um, they are very welcome. Those who are interested, they are very welcome to contact us um, via the Free Russia Foundation and uh, suggest their ideas for articles. Um, okay. Um, well, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, as Anton mentioned, uh, this is a, a quarterly publication. You can um, find it at Free Russia Foundation website. Um, I want to thank our, our guests, uh, Alexandra Yatsik, John Fairslick, sorry if I've mispronounced your surname, and uh, my friend and, and colleague Anton Chekhovsov, uh, and we will see you next time. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, and yeah, see you next time. My pleasure. Thank you very much.